Yeah, just uh, what you were just saying. Uh, you know, a guy comes into the system, you know the type of person you're going to get into the system. He's, he's committed uh, an offense. And when, by the time they get to the prison system, they've been sentenced. You know, and I know Millhaven would probably look better as a parking lot, but for that type of a criminal, or whatever he's called, what do you do with him? Right. Be before I started working at it, before I put this uniform on, I worked at, at a penitentiary. I worked a volunteer group at St. Lawrence Group Achievement Home for about two and a half years before I started the pen. And when I started the pen, I still went to St. Lawrence Group Achievement Home, and the kids were asking me there, what goes on? What, you know, what gives in there? So you try to enlighten them, and, and that's where the program was talking about Operation Breaking. But what I, the point I'm trying to make here is that the people I dealt with in that group home have many similarities with the adult criminal. Intelligence-wise, they've got the intelligence, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be channeled to, to benefit. The energies don't seem to be channeled. Um, where can we find common ground to talk about problems, release uh, views, uh, vitality, and uh, come to some common... like? Today's meeting for me, as will be tonight at Queen's University, will be is a time that you can understand at, at least a, a beginning of what I go through as a, as a correctional officer, and hopefully other correctional officers will be, will be able to, to share that limelight. Other uh, inmates are able to come out and talk. The public is able to be more informed. I mean, where does the government become accountable to the taxpayers that ki that cost forty eight uh, roughly forty eight thousand dollars a year per inmate. Well, let's just hold it there. Then, when you say that the, the accountability of finances, and you're talking, let's build more institutions and let's make them smaller. My God, if you're getting screams now, what are you going to get then? I Mr. think I think Mr. Trono said that uh, he asked the Canadian ta the, the government asked the Canadian taxpayers, and the taxpayers didn't want uh, smaller institutions because it costs more money. I don't think people. I think don't think anybody asks the Canadian taxpayer what they want. And if they mapped it out and explained to them that a smaller institution, in fact, makes sense, that it costs a lot more to keep 75 people in one institution than to keep 500 in, yeah. but there's yeah. less going to be less recidivism when you say so. Less guys will come back. I, I agree with you. It might make more sense, and it might cost more money, but you're not going to know whether it's going to work until you put the building up. That just cost you a million and a half dollars. That's yeah. why I'm not suggesting you know? any type of thing. What I am suggesting is people yeah. get together and talk about their problems. And what I'd like to see eventually is that the, the institutions, at least maybe for an afternoon or a series of afternoons, <coughs> is closed down where inmates can relate to students supervised by professors and teachers mm -hmm. that they can do maybe psychological tests, they can do behavioral tests, simply listen to the guy. I mean, we were talking about earlier yeah. about uh, uh, people that are high profile within the institution and, high, and people that aren't. I've seen inmates that aren't high profile and all they want is a cell change mm -hmm. and nobody will listen to them. They can't get out to the bosses to see because the bosses are busy. And just out of frustration, smash the hell out of their cell and everything else to go around with it. I've walked down the range and looked at the inmate. The inmate looked at me, and I says, "Well, you're going to start cleaning up." And he says, "Yeah," but he had to he had to let those frustrations out. It's a lack of communication, you know, and that guy could have been on a program. He could have like the programs Mr. Trona was saying that was implemented. But in all these the are people that don't have autonomy. These are people that that have been growing up in society that have had little or no parental educate uh, parental guidance. Uh, leadership qualities or good qualities within the particular individual creativity was never yeah. developed. But you know, you can't educate all the parents. You know, where are you going to start? No. I'm sorry. Uh, education is what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, communication. Where you start, Communi you start with yourself, and you become involved. What do you want me to do? You're doing it. You're here, and we thank you. This. There's this lots of things that you can. I yeah. just. This isn't a question. I just have to say something. When you start talking about the type of person you get in prisons and that type of person, um, you're stereotyping in a dangerous way, I feel. Not you, but one is stereotyping. Perhaps they do share a lot of characteristics in common. Stereotyping, you put your finger on Like Mr. Trono was saying, well, we got a guy coming in from Toronto. He killed a policeman or he, uh, he, he committed a murder or something. Well, that doesn't mean that that guy, when he comes to the institution, almost invariably, it's the guys are in for sensational crimes on the street, like, you know, even like murder policemen or something. They come in, they got so much to lose that they go through the prison population and you hardly ever hear from them. The lifers go through so smoothly. And it's the guys that come in for three years for stealing a car, you know, 
They come in, they're so frustrated, they've got such a low profile, nobody's really listening to them, they don't feel important enough, so they start smashing their cells, they start probing with shanks and start uh, lead pipe justice and all that, and all of a sudden they got a high profile, and so you would never have <coughs> preconceived that this guy that got picked up in Toronto for three years for car theft and didn't even get make the newspapers because you don't make the newspaper, you say, well, actually, Millhaven is more full of volatile guys and not lifers. And not then comes the concept of college for crime, where, where a juvenile delinquent or a person 16 to 17 years old would go into the penitentiary, do a B&E, do a series of B&Es, and finally get hit fed, t fed time. Uh, he's going to be affiliated with, with, with master criminals, people that have done uh, armed robberies, for example, versus the guy that's done B&Es. He's going to learn from the guy. He's going to learn how to hold a gun because he, he, he hears it, he it sounds excited to him, and he wants to do it. So when he gets out, that's his most ultimate goal. As a result, we've got recidivism to the rate at 81%, I believe. And another... Y yes, Dennis? Yeah. Why not? Yes. <laughs> I was wondering you're coming. Yeah, I, I I had to jump on that one, Barry. That 81% recidivism. I heard you mention that once before. The last figures that I had showed that 64% of everybody coming to federal prisons is there for the first time, and 64 and 81% don't jive. There's one other thing that I just had to jump on, and and I hope you'll bear with me. You mentioned that in the evening at Collins Bay with 30 or 40 officers on them, 400 inmates, that the guys have no educational programs and they sit in their drum and a little later you mentioned they've got nothing to do except play on their handball courts and play on their volleyball courts and play in the gym which is equal to the YMCA and get library books and get all the inside it's groups. Well, I don't know what you do in the evening. Usually I watch TV unless I'm still here this evening but generally if I want to... <laughs> Generally, if I want to get educated or get involved in a work program, I'll do it during the day. I'm, I'm not fortunate enough I can go to school during the day. The inmates are. So really don't undersell the programs that are going there. No, there are some very no, valuable no, programs not. that are costing a taxpayer a bundle, yes, and I really don't think that you should attempt to undercut them at all. No, I, I'm not trying to undercut them at all. What I am trying to do is that they aren't providing the answer that is needed. You aren't, you're, you're comparing yourself, you're comparing a person that has learned certain values and, at, at a, and morals at an at early age. These people have not. I'm talking about opportunities for oh, people to have... The, the CPS definitely support... They do go to school during the day. They do, yeah. they, they're fortunate enough to be able to go to school during the day, and they don't want to do that in the evening. That means that what are they doing in the evening? Are they sitting around, having had all the schooling they want during the day, doing nothing? In the evening. We don't let, let me give you the average choice. The average choice at Collins Bay, they can watch TV if they want to. They can watch movies two or three times a week if they want to. They, they've got, I believe, 14 different social groups coming in from the outside you every have to be evening. To be, to you, go to the you no, there's a 10 plus group which is yeah, totally to involved. Ten, ten okay, more. so so if you happen to be a member of the Native Brotherhood, if you happen to have a religious bent, if you happen to be French, that there to be are alcoholic, sure there are groups there, <laughs> but. I, I'd consider really that the average inmate in Collins Bay or any other institution for that matter during the evening he's got a hell of a lot more to do with his time than I have really the only of, difference he has is, too much time the only difference is that he can't walk outside that institution and go into the hotel down the road and therefore you could come back to the old cliche if you can't do the time don't do the crime really you've got to remember who are locked up the people who are locked up as a general rule are the criminals and the people who look after them, as a general rule, are Talk the good guys types. and don't really confuse oh. which is which. No offence, yeah. Roger, you're out now. You did your time. <laughs> I don't want to get into an argument. Well, you could, there's, there's no argument. There, I, I, I see, I, I think actually we've just been talking for an hour and nothing has been really said as a question of fear, because there really isn't as much to say you're there's right the guys work in the daytime in the shop others go to school and at night mr trono would encourage very much that the guys go out to the recreation field and bat the baseball around or the handball around or lift them weights and get rid of all that aggression and frustration i there isn't a guy very few guys in Millhaven right now, and as primitive as it sounds, and they may only have three years left or four years, wouldn't say, I'll put my arm there, you take a hatchet, 
and you cut my arm off. I got everything. I want my freedom. And the thing that is so frustrating, there, a man is made for the company of a lady. And a lady in a woman's prison is made for the company of a man. And you take that away, you can give me anything you want. The one thing you suffer the most is that female come, Even just seeing kids and hearing their voices and be able to open your own door and to be able to go into your own refrigerator and all that. In other words, there's a personal side so to, what do we to do? the criminal. Do we open all the doors to no, no, the no. Just I'm saying there's no answer. I'm just saying if the guys didn't have punching bags, didn't have baseball, it'd be the guards would be suffering themselves. They'd be battling among each other. The only thing that saved my save at sanity was sports, weightlifting. I worked like I was supposed to do in the shops in the daytime. I did my thing in the daytime. And and you, naturally, there's no reason now. We're in the 20th century. You don't lock the doors 18 hours a day like when I first went into prison. You say, OK, you had supper at 5 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, you got recreation. From 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock, you got a choice. You can go in a little room, and there's a TV set up in the top there. You can sit there and watch the TV set while the guys are all playing cards behind. You can't hear the TV set. And the guy, card players are yelling to the TV guys, turn the TV down. The TV guys are saying to the card players, well, keep your voice down. And the guys are just saying, to hell with this. So they get up, and they go out in the yard. And they start pushing weights. And as they're going to the yard, the guard hesitates to open the barrier. The guy's hostility. The guards are angry. The inmates are angry. And Mr. Trono made those sports recreations. It's to let the pressure off the steam cooker. And basically, all they really want, they sure they did wrong. I, I know, it'd be absolute absurdity to say, oh, I'm in prison and they took my freedom away. It's their own fault, my own fault. I, I don't blame anybody but myself. But it doesn't mean you're not hurting. And a lot of people go in for crimes that they do on a spontaneity of the moment, you know? But it's, there's no answer to anything. There's some people from the high, local high schools that are here. Do, do they have anything to... to I wonder if I could say something oh, yeah, else before yeah. we get off into high schools. The, the thing that we've sort of passed up and haven't noticed, haven't mentioned at least, is the fact that the kept want to get out. Or they want to make life a little bit more interesting for themselves. Now, if I was an inmate, I probably would do that too. And there's all kinds of ways that are more interesting if you can beat the system. We're paid to see that you don't, they don't beat the system, and they're trying to beat it. I don't think there's much concentration on beating the system. I think that's a catchphrase, too. Well, I don't think so. You know, I think when a guy can make a brew yeah, and go and drink it, well, oh, the individual, like hell, you go around there Christmas time and every individual's in it, just about. <laughs> But you know, people are, and people how are, trying, to, people are trying to get out, uh, out of those places. We're trying to stop them. Um, it's certainly, we, we try and we have to search their cells from time to time to see that they aren't hiding things in there that they shouldn't have. Marijuana, um, booze, weapons. That makes that's for hostility. Said, that's a, it's almost a game. That's going to be Absolutely. forever. It's in sure. the army. It's every. But you know another thing, Mr. Patrono, I was just thinking, you're talking about all them programs. All them programs you're talking about, <coughs> especially we talk about evening programs, the school programs, the, the social programs where the people come in 10 plus and all that. But one thing has been neglected them and said. All them programs have been instituted by the inmates themselves. What they would do, the inmate committee or inmate groups would say, we're going to start a group to help ourselves. We're going to relate to the people in the street. We're going to have invite people in, in from the street. And this is a program. Will the administration go for it? And they say, well, make it as clear and as simplified as possible. Get all the answers, all the negative, positive things, all on paper. And then we'll go up and we'll present it to the warden. And the warden will represent it, present it to Mr. Trona, perhaps, and we'll try and get approval. And then you guys say, geez, that's a good program. OK, we approve it. And he's sort of almost taken credit for these programs. And in fact, it's all the inmates that institute these programs, where the retarded kids come in. Uh, what's that, yeah, what's that yeah. special yeah. Olympiad? No, the administration have a very, you go in every year, I see you there, you know, and everybody else does. And I go in one of the schools. Yeah, some of the MPs, well, they go in there, but who did it? Sure. Every conceivable and isn't aspect that, of it has been done by Isn't the that the way it should be? Administrators get on the bandwagon you, and say, sure. but we that's implemented this program. Them, to help a bit, to, to give them a helping hand. This year, the Collins Bay administration has cut completely their contribution, financial contribution to the Olympiad sure. from that's the budget. Right. So that if the weekend is going to happen this year, the inmates have to raise all the money themselves. Well, don't they do that themselves? I don't. Th they, uh, that's they, what they wanted. They, they, no, yeah, there was a certain degree of independence yeah, there. I think yeah, that they, they wanted, wanted to move away. They organized it themselves, but they certainly wouldn't have minded getting some money. <laughs> but you, you I, I realize, from the, the point of view of an administrator, when you open up a program for the Olympiad, the risks that you're taking. 
And every time you let someone out in a temporary absence, the risks that you're taking? So it's, it's easier, it's easier, Roger, to say no to every damn thing than you never put yourself you at risk. You've got a bit of a reputation of huh? sticking your neck out, and I always respected that aspect of you. And, but there's very few guys that will stick their neck out and uh, will stand on their own and stick their neck out. And when the few individuals do, it's a shame when you see them smack. Right yeah, but down. without patting myself on the back, when you stick your neck out, you do it intelligently. Well, you know, hmm? you, can, you stick your neck out and you start, sometimes you can't go back. I guess I'll applaud that. I think what we're getting into is a really emotional state here because we've got jiving things and everybody I can see in the audience is just. But what I wanted to ask is, okay, the inmates have these programs, the schools, etc. Isn't it in the end, okay, the institution has a responsibility to it, it's incarcerated, but in the end, <coughs> are you in fact denying responsibility of the inmate to take part in his rehabilitation. That's the message I'm getting is that he's got these things, but he hasn't got enough. But okay, he can go to school all day, but he hasn't got anything to do at night. Any individual has to come across and do these things. And are you saying that the institution isn't providing enough for him to do? I'm saying the institution makes a darn good effort to provide this person with a certain degree of autonomy, but with the amount of, of people they have to deal with, with the the multiplicity of, of situations that evolve from the, the large number of people it almost makes their job impossible and that's why I've suggested the need for eventually to, to close the institution and let inmates talk with, with students and, and professors and let them express themselves in, in a more intelligent way. Okay, and you, d you don't feel that, the, what about Odyssey or do you feel that that's in any way a way for them to speak? I think that it's a darn good beginning. Uh, as I do uh, John Howard Society, uh, 10 plus group is a very um, significant group within this region. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> now there's, there's a variety of things, but it, they, they don't seem to reach the very... I think we're, we're, when we're dealing with an alcoholic, when we're dealing with a, a, a per particular individual that, that is addicted to drugs, say, um, and there's many of them within that because they haven't they they have found an outlet with with drugs and it's it's an easy way out. I certainly don't blame the institution for that. Um, but to me, the criminals and uh, say let's go to the almost ultimate. Everybody knows about it. Clifford Olson was paid ninety thousand dollars for this to, to the family. Uh, the Civil Liberties Association, Alan Boyville, called that pr uh, presumptively repugnant. I don't think that when, when we're dealing with Clifford Olsons or we're dealing with criminals, we deal with them on a personal basis. And I think that, that's a key point. And I also would, would, would further that statement quickly by saying that Clifford Olson and people like him are, are a symptom, not the disease. And unless you get down to the very bottom of, the, of that person, or the overall group of uh, collective individuals within the confines of a pen service or in, 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 in society in general, um, perhaps you would be able to develop a certain happiness, a certain creativity within that individual to make him feel happy with so, his life, so he's a self-contributor. So do you think the institution can do that, or you're saying that society creates this person, in effect, right? And so by the time he hits the institution, Hasn't he decided what he wants to do, and it's not really going to be anybody but him that's going to make the change? Very true. So do you think the institution can do anything? I think the um, institution would be able to provide opportunity, which they do right now. But I think that that opportunity must come from the first-line worker, must come from the first-line people, such as inmates. And the idea that I'm trying to project is to get these people together. You're not going to get them to, you'll probably get all I'm saying is you put, you document their problems, people are going to know about them, and maybe within their life circumstances they'll be able to render them and, and work with the administration. Um, people have said that I'm against the administration. I'm not against the administration. I think they do it, um, at, they try their <coughs> damnedest to, to get what they feel necessary for that particular individual, but I think, I'm simply saying it must be more, and it must be the wor first line worker that, that brings that down to, to a grassroots level. Thank you. you talk about your job. Um, you, um, you, you stand up, you, stand up, you talk about the 
environment that you have to put up with, you talk about the things you have to do, and you get negative feedback from your colleagues and from the administration, and everything you talk about seems to, what you have to put up with seems to conflict with your own ethics, and how can you stay with the service? In other words, my, is my job a conflict of interest, perhaps to my own ideology? It's just what you do and what you speak in against. Because I, I guess, okay, I may have faced anybody that stands against the norm or doesn't face their nose in the way everybody else is, is pointing their nose is bound to face some sort of repercussion. I think the, the conflict of interest you might be suggesting um, and, and you say that I faced opposition with, with guards. Yeah, sure, I, with, and with inmates, so I suppose, to some degree, but mostly with administration. The, admini the inmates now, when I go into the institution, comment into where I'm working. I'm isolated. Um, the inmates will, will want to communicate. Uh, people in the John Howard, basically what I'm saying is I've worn this uniform for five years, and, and when I've done what I've done, the cons are able to look in new light about this uniform because there's a person under this uniform <coughs> and if I can project that personal side of, of an officer I think and, and be so get my point across to some degree then maybe somebody else will come across and and um, communi communicate and, and contribute so the idea of, of I, I yes I do face opposition but I have some very strong support too Andy I uh, had an interview myself with uh, Mr. Dennison, and he was speaking about the hate tradition. Now, I personally feel that anybody who is born is not, I mean, they're not born a hardcore criminal, and whether they're a minimum security prisoner or maximum. And when he was talking about the hate tradition, I thought that maybe you don't have, maybe it is expensive to build these uh, the, like these mini prisons, so there's more attention and understanding to them. But the thing is, is I feel that we all have deep emotions, even the hardcore criminal does. And he has emotions, maybe as he maybe he has killed many people, but it's probably a result of his environment or something else. But I feel just the fact that if the guards and the inmates at least kind of talk to each other, I don't I don't I say you know give the guard his gun, let him clean it for me, not that. But I am saying, <laughs> if you don't treat somebody like a human being, sure you have these groups, you have all kinds of groups, you have sports, and just with, just as he was hitting on, like, you don't, you, they can't see a, a, a small child. It's filled in emotions and frustrations. You can give them all the recreation they want, but they are human beings, unless you don't hit on that fact that they are humans. And if you're if you're looking for rehabilitation in prisons, and if if you want them to change, to go out to society, at least treat them like human beings. I think. You let them talk openly and communicate yes. with staff members and administration. And well, I, I don't. I don't agree with you. <laughs> the fact is, if you don't want uh, rehabilitation, if you don't believe, if you say people are kind of it. Why don't you bring back capital punishment, hang them like back in the foot trauma? Because in a sense, is that not what many people are doing? The slow death? Yeah, it is like a slow death. <laughs> Suicide. Uh, you don't allow them to get out their emotions. And it is a slow death. Maybe it would be better if you maybe just brought capital punishment. But I'm saying if, if you don't show them understanding, if the guards don't show them understanding, as human beings, well, I don't feel they do, they do have much chance on reforming themselves, and we expect them to go to society and treat society good that, well, how can we expect them to do that? And we ourselves, and, and guards, can't treat them like human beings. <laughs> they can't treat them like human beings. You know, why should they expect them to go to society and say, you know, I think, we're going to be good? Exactly. I think capital punishment is one very easy answer. Um, it, it's, it's easy to say, lock them up, throw away the key, kill them, uh, to hell with them. But it's much easier, it's much harder and uh, much more complex to do with individuals, not only as a group, but as individuals. There was uh, a question over here, I think, wasn't there? Yeah. You better stand up and go. Yeah.
Do they still give people long terms and call it solitary confinement? Uh, you can be locked up for in the special handling unit at Millhaven, and it's a four-year program to get in. You have to ask the man behind you why. Is it, how long is it the, the different stages, the minimum? It takes them three years to go through the program. The last year is in a, back in a normal population of Yeah, okay, so, so let's, say, two let's take a look at what we got in the special handling unit. Yeah, yeah, true. But, if but then again, we not only have the special handling unit these days, we've got medium, maximum, uh, SHU is super maximum. And now we're having another one, super, super maximum. Where does it end? Excuse oh. me. I don't want to get in any confrontation here. I just make to make a brief little statement. Um, I have talked to some of the people that are in the field of corrections, and I think there, that there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of caring people. There are a lot of programs uh, that are run that are really, really good. I can't speak any louder. <laughs> and. Um, I think if, if we're not just a little bit cautious about um, um, the way we talk about inmates or guards or anything else, we would be remiss. I think we, we can't lose sight of some of the crimes that have been committed and some of the people that are incarcerated. And uh, we all seem to be talking about the same thing here, just general caring about people. But I don't really think that you can... You know, it has to come from both sides' understanding, too, and i just like to make that, that point, okay? Those both sides have to be allowed. And right now, we, ha we seem to have an unwritten rule that we're not allowed. Um, Excuse me, I don't understand. Who's not allowed to what? I don't, I don't quite... Care for, like, uh, my particular situation, some people may have the attitude that I'm some type of con lover, and for that reason, I'm ostracized. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm not, I don't look at them as a con, I look, just look at them as people. And I see that they're people that are hurting, and maybe, definitely, we cannot forget about the crime. That's why they're there. But while they're there, let's, uh, let's give them an environment that will provide a certain degree of autonomy, that will provide communication to heighten this man's development in life. I think we're assuming here that because the, a lot of people in the field aren't as vocal perhaps as others that this isn't going on and I think I saw a lot of that. I just like to make that point, that's all. Oh, that I, I'm sorry. I like to make the point that I did see a lot of caring by correctional workers when, you know, in the field. I don't think that... Particularly before uh, a major uprising happens, you'll, you'll see the um, <coughs> numerous letters being passed for the inmate population to to particular guards where they ask the guards to act as some type of mediator so the place won't blow and that often happens and yes there is many <coughs> individuals within the rank and file of the Canadian Penitentiary Service that do care. I think there's a great deal of them. I do too but I think there should be more of it. I don't, know if this is going, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to come out of the question or a statement or not, but one of the things I find when we talk about prisons failing to rehabilitate is we classically are talking about two different things. People say prisons don't rehabilitate, look at the crime rate, which is a pretty simplistic point of view, thinking that the penitentiary service, which handles less than 10% of the people who ever encounter the law, can possibly be held accountable for crime where we don't even know what the root causes of crime are. So in answer to your capital punishment, I could simply go to all the institutions and gas every inmate tonight, and the crime rate in Canada would not significantly change one iota. Okay. And I think it's really, really simplistic to do two things. One, to blame the inmate population who are released, who uh, do commit a crime, for those who do recommit, as being the major source of crime problems. And two, I think it's simplistic to blame the penitentiary service for failing to alter the crime rate. And that generally is the way we talk about rehab. One of the reasons why I got out of child care work was, was because I found I couldn't change the person in a very large environment that affected that person more than I ever could. Of course, I think that, you know, the problem is much deeper than simply saying to uh, commissioner of penitentiaries, here's a billion dollars, work with 10,000 people and, and change something in such an ingrained pattern of North American lifestyle. It's impossible. And I can tell you what we're facing right now is for every effort that anybody in corrections makes to continue to take chances, and I agree with what's been said, I think the penitentiary service does take chances. I was with John Howard for a long time, and I wrote lots of letters and said, you're not taking enough chances, but I do recognize they took some. 
We're talking in a time period, and you can see an increase in racism in Canadian society, and the more the economic situation deteriorates, you see every single example.